want to talk about the doctrine of enforced humility. You know, it's an interesting idea that you don't hear very many sermons on, on a whole sermon on humility. Yet it's, it's an enormous uh, doctrinal principle, both in the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Uh, because it orients its uh, humility, spiritual humility, comes from spiritual growth momentum, and it emphasizes the activity of gr God's grace in your life. If you, if you have true humility, spiritual humility, it's because you become very grace-oriented in your life. Not just by the way God deals with you and you deal with him, but how you deal with other people. <clears throat> it's a, in fact, a Paul in Colossians, we'll see tonight, uh, talks about eight, eight of the great virtues of spiritual growth maturity. And humility is one of those eight. I mean, it's right up there with some of the biggies. Uh, and so Jacob God is going to have to put Jacob. It's not that Jacob doesn't know the word of God. It's that he struggles with it when he gets under stress and difficulties in his life. He reverts back to old habits. And what he's missing in his Christian life is not the word of God. It is, the, it is the functional aspect of grace orientation in his life. When he gets under stress, he doesn't go to the grace principle. He doesn't go to the biblical principle and walk by faith. What he does is walk by sight. And so do you, if you're not careful. And one of the things that has to be corrected, and God will put you under enforced humility to teach you. Humility. He will teach you humility. You can learn it in the classroom or you can learn it in life. You know, people say the hard way. You can learn it the easy way, the hard way. Well, here we are in, in Genesis 32, 1 through 6 tonight. Jacob went on his way and the angel of God met him. And, and, and Jacob said when he saw them, this is God. Wait, wait, wait. Genesis 32. I want to make sure. Yeah, this is it. Um, verse 3. Then Jacob sent messengers before him to his brother Esau in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. And he also commanded them, saying, Thus you shall say to my lord Esau, Thus, thus says your servant Jacob, I have sojourned with Laban and stayed until now. That's 20 years later, by the way. I mean, Nobody's counting except me, I guess, but 20 years have passed. Uh, and I have oxen and donkeys and flocks, male, female servants, and I have, he talks about his wealth a little bit that he's willing to share. And I have sent to tell you, my Lord, that I may, uh, so that I may find favor in your sight. And the messengers returned with Jacob. And here's, here's where the pressure starts. I mean, he, he's, going, he's going home. And he's fearful of Esau because when he left, Esau said, I'm going to kill you. And he took his brother at his word, which is prob was probably a good thing. <laughs> he probably was thinking about 15 different ways he could have done it. Um, the messengers returned, and, this, and all of a sudden he falls into a, ca a, a, a cave. He says, as saying, we came to your brother Esau. And furthermore, he's coming to meet you with 400 men. 400 men are with him. Now, watch what happens with that news. This should not have happened. This should not have happened. He had the doctrine for this not to happen. But he switched off from doctrine and went into old way thinkings. You understand? He, fl he flipped back to his old pattern. Then... With this report, what's the report? They come back with a report. See, he sent them out to test Esau's mindset, right? I mean, he's, it's okay, I guess, but it wasn't necessary. But 
that's okay. I mean, nothing wrong with that. Except he drew a false conclusion. He drew he did what we tell you not to do, and that he he developed a false assumption. The, Jacob, listen what happened when he said four men are coming. Four hundred men are coming with Esau. Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. He died, divided the people who were with him and the flocks and the herds and the camels into two, two companies. Okay? He makes a false assumption about his brother and not a true assumption about God. Now, God's told him exactly what he'll do for him. He's made it very clear, and I'm going to show you that today. He should have never gone where he went. He should have stayed in a grace-orientated mindset. He should have stayed there. He doesn't, so God's going to have to teach him how to be grace-oriented in his life, no matter what the circumstances of life are. And that he's going to teach him. He's going to teach him. If, if he's teachable, you know, you can teach a lot of people ain't teachable, and they don't get the lesson. Right? You've had kids. Okay. So that's where we're going tonight. We're going to talk about enforced, enforced humility to bring him into a place where he is teachable about grace. Humility is all about grace orientation. It's the function of grace orientation in your life. It's never based on your circumstances of life. It's always based on what God's word tells you he will do for you. It's based on the promises of God, not on circumstances. If you focus on circumstances rather than on the word of God as a believer, then you're walking by sight, not by faith. Faith comes by Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God, right? So let's have prayer. We're going to talk about enforced humility. I gave you a moment of silence as a believer priest. Can't study the Bible in carnality. It's a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. Evidence of carnality in a believer's life is personal sin. Could be mental attitude sins. It could be sins of the tongue or overt sins. That's three categories. If I could just win you there, I'd give you a couple more, but let's just win those. First John 1 9 says, how do, how do you deal with it? If you confess your sin, you have that privilege through a believer priest concept in 1 Peter 2. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It restores you to spirituality. The Holy Spirit is a great teacher of the word of God. And he, not only does he te teach it for learning, but he teaches it for living. Father, we're thankful tonight for these who come our way by automobile and by internet. Especially for those who have chosen to stick with us on Wednesday nights as a study night. We're going to talk about enforced humility tonight, Father, out of the life of Jacob, which we have been studying on, on marriage and family. This is another part of that series. And we're going to see God do something in that family that could have never been done on Jacob's side of it based on fear and stress. But God is going to do something to show him the importance of trusting God, which means trusting his word. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Jacob, in our lesson tonight, is about to learn a lesson on the doctrine of enforced humility. But unfortunately, he's going to learn this lesson the hard way. And you can learn it the easy way. You can learn it the hard way. Uh, Hebrews, the 12th chapter, 5 through 11, shows you how to learn it the hard way. God disciplines you. Deuteronomy 8, 1 through 5, shows you how he does it in another aspect, the way he's going to do it with Jacob. And let me tell you something. That Deuteronomy 8, 1 through 5, is well worth your read on the subject of humility. I don't want to go there tonight because I don't have enough time in this hour to teach you to go everywhere, but it's well worth a read. Jacob has made a right decision in a wrong way. That happens to a lot of us. 
because we lose our focus with God. He has made a right decision, that is to return to the homeland. He has decided to return to the homeland with, a, with his new family and wealth. Now, where did he get all that? He got it from God. We get this because he's a genius, no more than you do, nor me. You do it because God is rich in his blessings to those who believe in him and follow him. He's just rich in his blessings. He has decided what he has decided when he, he sent his delegates out, that, the, his delegation out. That was, that was all right. Well, when they brought back the news, he fell apart. And it wasn't based on anything other than four men, 400 men coming, and he made a false assumption. Now, I'm going to show it to you tonight. I mean, you go like, oh, Ron, how do you get all that? Well, I, I'm going to show you I'm right out of the word of God. I'm going to show you out of the word of God. I'm going to show you. He is, here's what he's decided to do. He's decided to test Esau. Agreed? Sent delegations out. Then he comes back. Now he's got to come up with a scheme. And in doing so, listen, when he sends out to test Esau, in doing so, he, he, he tested God. I'm going to show you. And I'm going to tell you why. It's because God already had told him earlier exactly what he would do for him. In this circumstance, he had already told him. He laid out the directive will of God to him. I'm going to show it to you because I don't want you to miss this. That's why you come to Bible study. Do you remember at Bethel, the Bethel Bible study? Remember the Bethel Bible study? Hmm. Well, probably not. But the Bethel Bible study was when he entered the land. He left the land and was about to enter. But before he left the land, as the heir of the patriarch heir, he, ha he, went, he had a Bethel Bible study with God being the teacher. Now, I want you to look up that. I want you to look at this because this is, as he goes into the land, this is really important. I'm in Genesis 28. And here, here and this is the directive of will of God. I talk about this all the time. You need to really pay attention to me on this subject matter. I'm in chapter 28. This is the, this is the Bethel Bible study where he learns this. And I want you to look. Uh, you know, this is the famous Jacob Ladder business. And I want you to look at verse 13. Behold, the Lord stood above it, talking about that ladder to heaven. The, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of your father, Abraham, Isaac. What is that? Patriarchs. He's, he is the heir of the Abrahamic covenant. He is a patriarch. He is a, he is the, uh, listen to me. He is a patriarch heir of the messianic seed, which is Christ. We know that from Genesis 12. We're way over in 28 now. I am the Lord, the God of your father, Abraham, and the God of Isaac, the land on which you lie. I will give it to you and to your descendants. 14, your descendants, see, that's messianic. Your that's the seed that goes all the way back to Genesis 3.15, by the way. Your descendants shall also be like the dust of the earth, you shall, and, and you shall spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and the south, and in you and in your descendants shall all the families of the earth be blessed. That's Messiah. The all, only way all the families of the earth are blessed is through Christ. Church, who knows that better than you and I? Now watch verse 15. This is key. This is a big one now. Here, here he, now he's laid out the Abrahamic covenant and his directive will. Now watch the directive will come down to the present situation he's in. Now this is him going into the land. Here's what he tells him. This is 20 years earlier he laid this out. Now he's going to remember this dream where this ladder come down. This is a big deal. Now watch. Behold, I am with you. You know what that means? I am always with you. I'll never leave you nor forsake you is what that means. I am now and always will be with you. And you will keep and, and I will keep you wherever you go. In other words, 
I'm never going to leave you. I'm going to be right there next to your side. I'm your protector. And I will bring you back to the land. I. It is God who has taken the responsibility and laid out in his promise what he would absolutely 100% do for him. Are you with me? Listen to what he says. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised to you. And he laid out the promise in 13, 14, and 15. That's the directive will of God for his present life situation. Just like, just like when we, we read this thing like Galatians 5, 16, walk, walk by means of the Holy Spirit and you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. That's a present tense. Or, or uh, walk by faith and not by sight. Again, the same thing. Okay. I mean, these are directive wills for your present life, you see. And so remember, and here's my point. Remember that at the Bethel Bible study, when God revealed him the directive will of God regarding leaving and returning, are you with me? Did he not lay that out? The leaving and the returning. And what he said I, and I will walk you through this whole deal. I will walk you right through this. I'll walk you in and I'll walk you out and I'll walk you back home. Are you with me? I'm not making this stuff up. Okay. I'm just reading what's there, people. In, well, we're in Genesis. Go over to 31 a moment. This is when Jacob leaves. I just want to, I'm, my whole lesson's on this, but I just want to show you something. Now he's ready. Now 20 years have passed. And we, all, we know a lot of his life about that, especially family, marriage and family. Now he's ready to leave the land and go back home. He's, he's ready to leave. Um, and listen what he says to him. I am the God of Bethel. Where you, where you anointed a pillar, you know, he, he, he built an altar on, in remembrance of the Bethel Bible study. Where you made a vow to me, now arise, leave this land, and return to the land of your birth. Guess who is, has been faithful to him even when he wasn't faithful to him, right? Who's been faithful to Jacob even when Jacob wasn't faithful to him? God. Can I tell you that's true in your life as well and how important that is? I mean, he tells you in Hebrews 13, I think it's 5, 5 or 8. I can't get those mixed up. But 13th chapter, 5 or 8, where he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Jesus, same today, you know, that business. Now, look down to verse 38. I'm just showing you, he's about to go out and go, guess who's talking to him? About, about what? The Bethel Bible study. Right? Look at verse 28. 31. I hope that's right. Thir Maybe it's 38. 28 don't make sense. Oh, I, it was to show you 20 years. These 20 years, I have been with you. And then he goes into, he, and I'm just showing you that he was in there 20 years. All right? In other words, You may have an episode in your life of 20 years and you've been all over the place. You was with God, not with God. You were on fire, not on fire. You, you were this, you were that. And so you've been kind of in a wilderness for 20 years, like the Israelites were for 40. Been kind of in a wilderness, but you haven't been alone. You're never alone, people. You're never alone. Even when you're not willing to walk with God, he's always, because of his promise, walks with you. Right? Through your bad decisions, through your good decisions, he never leaves you. You know why? Because he promised he would never do that in Christ. You do not have to face your problems alone. You do not have to do that. Listen. 
You might carry an eraser, but he doesn't. I'm just telling you that God is trustworthy and humility is about bringing that trustworthiness of God into your life no matter what is going on. You can't let a, a piece of news distract you in your life no matter whether it's good news or bad news in your opinion in your opinion whether you consider it good or bad God considers it what it doesn't matter how you evaluate the news that comes to your life God always considers it to be what good Romans 8 28 always and at some point in your life humility see humility always sees that Humility, humility always sees it because humility is the function of grace orientation in your life to the directive will of God. It always sees that. Now, it may take a week, you know. It may take two days of crying. I, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that humility is a key. It is humbling yourself under the mighty hand of God. It's not your mighty hand that will deliver you. It is the mighty hand of God. You see, what Jacob's going to forget because of news that he put false assumptions to is the promise that God gave him at the Bethel Bible study that he reminded him of that on his way out. After 20 years, agreed? See, the only difference with you sitting there today and me sitting here is I've studied all this ahead of you. When you go home, you study all this, you'll see it. You see? The directive will of God, listen to me, here's what I'm after. The directive will of God will cover all the variables. Say all. <laughs> will cover all the variables so that Jacob could walk by faith and not by sight. God don't leave you hanging out. He don't leave you hanging over a cliff and go like, well, are you going to be a good boy or not? You know, holding your legs over a cliff. I mean, he, he tells them right up front what he's going to do. He, he, listen, and Jacob's no different than you or I. In fact, we hold a higher position than he held with God. We're in Christ. I mean, his completion of the redemptive program in his life is dependent on me and you, right? Actually, you and me. Hebrews 11, 39, and 40. Well, you better learn that one. I can see a blank in your face. But Jacob sent a delegation. Listen, Jacob sent a delegation to test Esau's mindset, but in doing so, he tested God's. Do you understand that? Because, listen, he was given a heads up 20 years ago and then reminded before he left. God wanted to bring that Bible study current. You say, how do you know that, Ron? Because I just gave you scriptures that show it. I didn't make this up. And what is he after? He's after you walking by faith and not by sight. You spend so much of your energy walking by sight. And listen, you should be walking by faith. You're, if you're a believer, now listen, if you're not a believer, then sight's the name of the game. Sight's the name of the game. But if you're a believer, sight is not the name of the game. It is not the name of the game. You're to walk by faith, not by sight. And listen, it takes a while to get that. And God is patient. Much more patient than we are. To get us this place. And when you get to that place, it's good. I'll tell you what's going to be the earmark in your life. Humility. And I don't know humility when you put, you, put on your, your good clothes. <laughs> 
I'm not talking putting put when you put on your best face, your best foot forward. You know all those sayings. Now, I don't mean that. That's phony baloney. I'm talking about when crunch time comes, you still are relying on God. When crunch time comes, listen, crunch time is going to come. You need to be prepared ahead of time, and that's what God is trying to do. That's what he's doing tonight, just like he did at Bethel Bible study. He's doing it at the Birmingham Bible study. The directive will of God will cover all variables so that Jacob could walk by faith and not by sight. Jacob sends a delegation to test Esau's mind, but in doing so, because he's been prepped in the directive will of God, he now is testing God. You, to do, you do understand that. Gee whiz, come on, people. When the delegation returned with the news of Esau, Esau was their report. He's already headed your way with 400 men. Jacob panicked. You know what he should have done when there was a conflict in his mind, when he, when he went into inner dialogue and he got nuts in, in the house, he was in the nut house talking to himself. You know what he should have done is shut it down and did what? What's the Bible say? Right? What's the Bible say? Well, I have a word of prayer if you want, but you still got to come. What's the Bible say? You're getting nutty about what? What's the Bible say about what you're going nuts over? Because you're walking by sight, not by faith. So let's get into the faith system. Because in the sight system, he may started making false assumptions. And we know what that does. I've taught that enough. Jacob panics. Based on what? what what's causing him to panic? A false assumption. Does he know what J Esau's going to do? No. Does he know why he has 400 men? No. So he makes false assumptions. He he could get a job in Hollywood. He just wrote a script. There's going to be violence, blood, and, and oh, it's going to be gory, and it's going to, there's going to be death, and oh, my day. It's not going to make Hallmark. That's what we do. We, we step into the nut house where we talk to ourselves without talking to God through the word of God. Well, how are you going to walk by faith in the nut house? No, the nut house is walking by sight, not walking by faith. What's the Bible say? What's the Bible say? What's the Bible say? What's the Bible say? Okay. Jacob was no longer, listen to me. This is so important because he's going to set up a strategy and his strategy is not going to be with God. Jacob was no longer content with the sovereignty of God handling the affairs of his life. You understand that? Oh, I better come up with a plan. Four, oh my God, 400 people going down here. Oh. What did God say? What did God? Calm down. You're getting nutty. Calm down. What did God say? Has, do you have a word from God in this? I don't know. I don't know. I can't think right now. Jacob, calm down. What's the Bible say? Jacob, calm down. Listen, calm down. Take a deep breath. <gasps> Take a deep breath. Take a deep breath. Somebody get him a Coke. Get him a Coke. Get him a Coke. Get him a Coke. <laughs> Not a diet one. Give him the real thing. He needs to get a shot right here, a little adrenaline. What has God promised you? What is God? See, this is how I counsel. You come in. <laughs> You've been to the night house. I go like, what's the Bible say? What has God promised you? Let's go to the Bible. What do you think? I got the, some kind of God. I don't have anything. It's let's go to the Bible and find it. If I can't find it, I'll find people that can help us find it. Please, people, please listen to me. Did he know what God had promised him? He sure did. Sure did. What should you do? You should walk by faith, not by sight. Say on your paper, you walk by what? I got two blanks. You walk by faith, not by? Yeah, I didn't see you write it down. You think you know it. Do you think Jacob at this point in his life didn't know what I just taught you? Do you think he didn't know a basic 101 principle that you walk by faith, not by sight? 
You don't get to where he is in the plan of God without knowing this basic 101 principle. This is so elementary, I hate to keep repeating it. But I do because here's a spiritually mature believer that misses this point because he's stressed out. I want to talk about four things. One, and remember my subject, enforced humility. Jacob has forgotten in the midst of this panic over false assumptions. Jacob has forgotten a very important doctrine, doctrine that trumps everything else he's experiencing right now. You know what the primary doctrine that he's missed? The primary purpose and mission and destiny that he has in the plan of God. Do you know what that was? He told him in Genesis 28, 14, you know what it was? I told you. What was it? He is, he is the patriarch heir of the messianic seed. Now, is that a big deal? It was in Matthew 1, 2 when it talks about where Jesus came from, when he, where he really came from historically. Did he know he was the patriarch? Did he know that he carried the messianic seed through his descendants? Did he know it? Yeah. Had God reminded him before he went in the land where all this, he's going to get married and do all this stuff? Yeah. Do you think you don't, do you think the things you step into in your life, God hasn't prepared you for ahead of time? Do you think that, listen, no, what he has to do now is do retraining. Enforced humility is not teaching you something new, it's teaching you something old in a new way. He taught you in Bible study. You went to Bethel Bible study, but went to sleep. Or you got it, and now you went to, uh, because of panic on something, you've dropped into a zone that is not working for you. I love this principle, and I want you to get this principle. I wrote on your paper, Proverbs 15.33b. It says, be, listen to me, before honor comes humility. Before honor. Before honor. Now, you know what that means? It means God wants to bring honor to your life in the plan. You know, some of the guys that have honor, you say, well, Ron, do you, can you give me an idea about honor? Yeah, Hebrews 11. There's an honor system right there. All those people listed? You know what you have to have to get in there? If you get in the honor system, guess what you got to have? Before honor comes humility. Hey, by the way, do you know that God declared one person out of the old covenant that had more humility than all the people of the earth, than any other person in the earth? You know who that was? Moses. Moses. I didn't write this down because I thought it on the way coming. It's Numbers 12.3. Numbers 12.3, Moses. God declares that. Now, we probably would have thought of somebody else. Walking by faith. Now, listen to me now. Listen to me close. Walking by faith results in 100% of God's grace working. And zero of human, of, of, of believers work. Zero. Zero. Oh, that's going to be hard for you to swallow because you don't understand grace. Listen to me again. Walking by faith results in 100% of God's grace working and zero of a believer's working. That's grace. You don't have grace without it. Oh, you say, how do you know that? Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. I wrote it on your paper. You've heard it, me say it 100 times, but I'm making it applicable. Applicable. For by grace you've been saved through faith and not of yourselves. Uh, it is a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one can boast. 
That makes it pretty clear. Can't tell you how many people don't believe that. I can't begin to tell you how many Christians do not believe what I just said. And their life is all as the biggest mess like Jacob's is tonight. Point two. Jacob abandoned the directive will of God by a false assumption. Genesis 32, 8, for he said, if Esau comes to one company and attacks it, then the company will be left, that company will be left, the one company left will escape, right? So he divided them two, he come up with a scheme. Did he need a scheme? He already had one. It was the plan of God. It was the directive will of God. God had already laid the whole thing out how to do it. Nah, you don't like, listen, you, uh, so what did God promise in 15? I will be with you. I will keep you. I will bring you back to the land. So, you know, if he was with him, Jacob's panicking. He's coming up with all these schemes and all that. Well, one gets attacked and we'll spare the other. Listen, that'd be okay. That's walking by sight when you have the word. I'm not opposed to that strategy, but you don't need it because God already gave you one. One to fit in this very thing. You understand? You don't have to come up with it. He already told you. You walk by faith. So if I'd have been with him, I'd say, wait a minute, wait, wait a minute, bud. Wait, Jacob. You're in the nut room right now. Let's get back out of the nut room, get in the Bible room. What's the Bible say? What is the directive will regarding this issue? That's what's important. And did he know it? Yeah, he got it from the Bethel Bible study. God intervened a second time to reassure him. In, in Genesis 32, in Genesis 32, in Genesis 32, we were in 31 a moment ago. In Genesis 32, uh, 32, 24, I got wrote down, what did I write down? 24 through, I don't know, I'm not going to read all that. 24, that, that, watch it, watch now. Jacob comes out, and he, he's, he's struggling with God, he walking by sight, not by faith. Are you with me? He's struggling with God. He's come up with all these schemes. And so we have this famous, listen, he went in the land, he had the, Jacob's ladder. When he comes out of the land, he's, he still won't, he still, it, it, this is how enforced humility comes in line, still not listen to God. He's heard him, he believes it, but he can't apply it. He won't apply it. He won't walk by faith, he walks by sight. So now he's got the wrestling match, right? Wrestles all night, right? Wrestles all night. It limps the rest of his life to remind him because he's a slow learner as far as application. What's important is what happened there and what God told him. Now, here's that wrestling match, which starts in verse 24. And I'm, I'm, I'm just running down here. The Pinnell, this is, listen to me now. This is called the Pinnell Bible Study. The Pinnell Bible Study. This is now he's coming out of the land, going back to the, right. You see that? He had a Bible study going in that was essential with the direct will of God. Now, please listen. 20 years later, he's going to have one called the Pinnell Bible study coming out. Gigantic. One. They were gigantic. In fact, they're so big that you teach them to little kids. These are stories you teach to little kids. Who hasn't heard of Jacob's Ladder and this wrestling match? All right. Let me drop down here. Watch some of the things that happens in this. Uh, one of the things that happens is God changes his name. Changes it from Jacob to, to, in verse 28, he changed his name from Jacob to Israel. And he, the reason he did that is because he prevailed with God. Listen, listen. But your name will be changed to Israel for you have striven, striven with God and men and have prevailed. 
That's why he's called Israel. Listen, he struggles. What are they struggling about? They're struggling over the direct will of God. And so God puts him under enforced humility to make him teachable. It's all humility is all about being teachable that God is sufficient to listen. Romans 4 21. God will. God is able to do what he's promised you. Just wait and let him do it. Be patient. Trust God. And so Jacob goes through this whole thing. And look at verse 30. So Jacob names the place Penel. For he said, I have seen God face to face. Watch this now. Yet my life has been preserved. My life has been spared. He walks out of this Bible study like the last one falls apart. This is the second time God has intervened to reassure Jacob of the directive will. They have wrestled out the will of God on this very issue. Listen to me. You know what this is similar to? Gethsemane. We all have a Gethsemane moment. This is his Gethsemane moment where we wrestle with God over his will and ours. And we surrender ours to his. They wrestled all night over this thing, like Jesus. And God says, you've prevailed. Because at some point, he surrendered. He submitted. Okay? We'll see how that goes. This is similar to Matthew 26 in Gethsemane. Just different players. Same. Listen, you're going to have these periods in your life. You're going to have these wrestling matches. God's will versus your will. Listen, the quicker you just surrender, God don't have to have you limp the rest of your life to remember this wrestling match. But listen, if that's what it takes for you to be obedient to the will of God, so be it. In other words, he wore this like like Saul, like uh, Paul did. He wore it as a bad badge of courage, didn't he? This thorn in the flesh. Point three. God is always ahead. Watch this now. I'm going to tell you, this is why you always walk by faith and not by sight. God is always ahead as well as present in the fulfillment of his directive will. God is always ahead of you. Always ahead of the directive will. He, listen, for 20 years, God, listen, while well, Jacob's been over here doing his thing, guess where God has been? Because God knows this day's coming. You know where he's been? Listen to me now. God has been over here working on Esau's heart. Nobody else has been able to work with it. Mom and dad couldn't work with it. Jacob was afraid to work with it. He wouldn't have sent a note home to him for nothing. You know who's worked on? Well, God is working Jacob. God is working Esau over here because this thing has got to work when he brings him back. Oh, Rod, how do you know that? The Bible tells me. That's how I know it. I too have read ahead. God's goal, God's goal was to make Jacob teachable by enforced humility. That's the purpose of enforced humility is to bring you to a place where you will stop belly aching and start learning. You know, when you're always talking, you can't, you can't hear. If you can't hear, you can't understand. If you can't understand, you can't have faith. That's why people, they fight all the time. Nobody ever listens because one is talking, the other's strategizing rather than listening. And the quarreling and fussing goes on and on. James 4. Listen to Psalms 25, 9. He leads the humble in justice, and he teaches the humble his ways. 
That's the key. If, if, if you're not a grace-oriented person that God is able, willing, and everything, and it all operates by the directive will, you're always going to be a mess. You're always struggling with God's will versus yours about all the silliest things in the world, as well as the big things like this. Is this as big as, listen to me, because we know ahead, we're sitting in the bleachers. Is this, is what he facing as big a deal as he thinks it is? No. No, it isn't. He's made a mountain out of a molehill. He did that all by himself, and I'm going to show it to you. I'm just telling you that the key of spiritual growth, maturity in life is to shut up and be teachable. Just shut up. You just talk way too much. Why don't you just learn? Now, listen, there's two ways to talk when somebody else is talking. You can verbally talk out loud or you can silently talk. Neither one is listening. And so you got one of my, my great verses is Psalms 27, 11, wait for the Lord. In the faith cycle, I always throw that up there. When it gets between, it gets down there to, to uh, application and completing, I pull this verse out and I say, wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. Be strong. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. Jacob can't do that. And maybe you can't either because you haven't, listen, you haven't learned humility. You're not teachable in humility. Jacob wasn't either, and God is going to teach him. He's going to, he's going to teach him. Isn't God wonderful? And this is a positive thing. Like that. He's not going to like this going on. But listen, you're not either. But she could have sat in class and got it. He was at Bethel class. He was pin out class. God was telling him about it, but he wasn't listening. I mean, he was listening, but he wasn't getting it. Wasn't willing to apply it, is my point. Wasn't willing to apply it. What, listen to me. What was Esau's real attitude and intentions toward Jacob after 20 years? Listen to, listen to Genesis 33, 4. Listen to Genesis 33, 4. Then Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him, and they both wept. All that fussing and worrying and strategizing, was it necessary? Had he told him ahead of time it wouldn't be necessary? Then why did he do it? Because he doesn't understand, he did not at that point in his life understand as a spiritual mature believer, humility. How the function of God's grace, the function of God's grace, orientation, how it works in the Christian life under stress. I mean, the real secret of God, what God's trying to do you, teach you to get you into humility is he puts you in stress. Stress, that's stress to you and that maybe to me. Huh? We all have something. We have our buttons, as they say. Now watch this. Here's Jacob over here. He's Esau over here. Who performed this miracle in this family over the, over the last 20 years? Nobody could have else done that. And listen, nobody else should have done that at that point because they were light, they were distanced from each other and had nobody. Listen. The family that was left there wasn't, wasn't good to either one of them as far as counsel in the plan of God. Neither one of them were. That's why they got a mess to start with. Parents wouldn't step up and take a role. Just let everything slide, let it slide, let it slide, let it slide, let it slide. And then it just slides right out into nothing. You know, there are opportunities in families that you can step up and do some great things. 
to just show them something. For example, when, when we take our family, we go off on things like take a trip. Everybody, inevitably, there's going to be a conflict arise. Just because you got so many different groups and so many people at different ages and yada, yada. It's taken me years to teach them. You don't run in, grab them, and separate them and do all that stuff. What you do is you step in there and have a word of prayer and get them oriented to God. It's too, it's too easy to run in and, 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 and grab and yank, holler and, and do all that stuff, and nothing ever corrects that behavior. I'll promise you, if you step into that atmosphere and say, let, let, let's have a word of prayer. They respect that. If they have any, if they have any respect for God, they'll, they'll stop and have prayer. S listen, there are a lot of ways to stop stuff, but boy, that's a good one. And then when you get through, then you have a discussion, and then you say, what's the Bible say? How should we resolve this? What's the Bible say? You don't go into human viewpoint. You don't go into sight. You don't get into panic. You go into the word of God. This is, how you, this is how you teach. This is the way God does it with us. This is how he teaches us. It's just so much easier just to yell and yank and storm and fuss. Go to your room and go to your room. No, they ought to go to the Bible first. And let's see if the room comes out later. But you know, that takes a little, that takes a little bit of spiritual stuff on our part. That takes a little bit of time on our part to do this, right? You may have to pull the food off the off the table and set it aside for a minute to actually deal with something spiritually rather than physically. I don't know. Just telling you what I know. Four, spiritual humility. Spiritual humility is grace oriented, is a grace oriented disposition of submission to the revealed will of God, listen to me now, no matter what the circumstance is, God is greater than whatever is coming up or whatever's on your plate. God is almighty. If I could get the church to ever believe that, that'd be wonderful. You believe that I say it, but I'll tell you when you really know it is when the rubber hits the pavement in your life and how you respond to it, whether you respond by sight or faith. That's the test. Listen to 1 Peter 5, 5 and 6. This is really important. You younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders and all of you as well as all of you. Clothe yourself with humility towards one another. For God is opposed to the proud, proud meaning not willing to submit to God, to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. How about that? You know what you need in episodes like this? You need God's grace. You don't need to switch in a belt all that yet. Let's see where it goes. Therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he might what? Exalt you. You know what exalts you? Grace, not works. Honor doesn't come without humility from God. Whether in your marriage, your family, right? This is a family affair, isn't it? Well, he's got all over that deal. Hmm? This is a family affair. Fair. Is God all over this deal? You sure, you sure is. See, he is about yours too. Therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. See, that's this. Never lose sight. Grace always says God is sovereign. He is an almighty God. The mighty hand of God. It's not the mighty hand of Jacob. It's not the mighty hand of Esau. It's the mighty hand of God. 
that he may exalt you at the proper time. You know what time that is? Whatever time God has for this thing to come to fruition. With that directive will of God to operate geographically, mentally, and operationally in sync with the will of God. Boom, there it is. Casting all your anxieties, all your cares on him because he cares for you. Casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. The, actually, I like the, I think it's King James. It uses the word cares ca because he uses it twice. Casting all your cares on him because he cares for you. But anxiety or worry or whatever that is that pushes you into sight. You, you do know that's where it pushes you. Sure it does. What's the Bible say? Oh, I'm so tired. Listen, here's what they, after a while they go, I'm so tired of, you always pull up the Bible and what's the Bible say? Well, we can learn this the easy way or the hard way. Listen, I'm just trying to help you. you. You will learn to be teachable because humility is all about being teachable. If he has to force you, listen, listen, look, 2 Timothy, 3rd chapter, 16, 17. Remember this one? I say to you in this, in this spiritual humility is characterized by the spiritually advancing believer being teachable by the inhale exhale of categorical Bible doctrine. That's the directive will of God being spelled out for you for what's ever occurring in your life. And you know what he says? He said, all scripture is, is God breathed and is profitable. Watch, watch what, what is profitable for? This is the easy way to learn it. You're going to learn this. You're going to learn this principle, the easy way, the hard way, but you're going to learn it. It's for teaching, for teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. Right? right? Now, God's going to do that. He's going to use the word of God to do it. But listen, you, you want that mighty hand of God to exalt you, not spank you. Hebrews 12 chapter says he will spank you to teach you, to teach you humility. I close with, with Colossians 3, 12 through 14. Here are eight virtues of spiritual maturity. Here are the ways you know. Well, am I a spiritual person? Am I growing? Am I growing in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ? Here's your test. See, if you, see how many of these characteristics you can identify in your life. So as to those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, that's church age believers, put on. A heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another, forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you. So also should you, and beyond all these things, put on. Now that word put on is carried over. See, that's one Greek sentence. 12 through 14 is one Greek sentence. There's not, a, not another verb put on. It is still talking about the one up above. Do I? Beyond all these things, put on love. Put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Okay? These are the characteristics you want to know if I'm in, you say, well, right, how, how would I know if I'm in spiritual maturity? Listen, these things flow from your life. You don't, these, these things flow from your life because you're inhale, exhaling, uh, living the Christian life. And these are, these are characteristics of spiritual maturity. The heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with another, forgiving one. These, these are in, these are in life situations. Beyond all these, put on love. All right. Well, let's have a word of prayer. We thank you, Father, tonight for a lesson on enforced humility. We know that's a good thing. It would be better that we could get it by volition, by being able to exercise humility in a situation that it would flow naturally from our life not have to go through some enforcement to make us teachable to the concept like Jacob. And so tonight, Father, I pray that 
you would encourage our hearts. I mean, this should be a simple thing in our life as we learn the directive will of God categorically in our life to apply it, to walk by faith and not by sight. And with it is the development of all these key characteristics of the identity of Christ in his great ministry to the world. This is what the world desperately needs out of Christians, just like these characteristics in the life of Christ when he traveled and he stops at a well, the well of Jacob, and talks to a, a lowly Samaritan woman, not in his eyes, but in the eyes of the world, and brings her to the knowledge of faith. A wonderful, wonderful exercise of humility. Well, encourage our hearts with this tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.